Welcome to Grace Bible Church. My name is Jacob Hantla. I'm one of the pastor elders here, and each week, every believer in attendance at our church gets the privilege to take part in what we call the Lord's Supper or communion. We take a piece of bread and a cup of juice, and those are physical reminders. They help us put our thoughts on the Savior we just sung about. They help us proclaim to one another Jesus' death until he comes. And typically what we do at this time is we take a, a passage of Scripture to help us uh, to help us meditate rightly, to help us think rightly about this God who we are remembering, Jesus who we are remembering and proclaiming. And so I want to do that today with Psalm 34. There are men who are ready to pass out some Bibles to you so that you can see God's word open for yourself on your lap. So if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and those men will get that to you. And if you do have a Bible... Open it to Psalm 34. This is a psalm written by David, and the context is given to us. It's after, it says, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. So that's a story from 1 Samuel 21, verse 10. You don't have to go there, but basically, right after having to flee Saul and saying goodbye to his best friend, Jonathan. Basically, David was being persecuted unjustly. Uh, he, he, everything was lost, it seemed. And he fled from his home into the land of Gath. On the way, he, he realized he didn't have a sword, picked up the sword of Goliath of Gath, and then found himself in Gath. And realized that that was probably not the best of ideas. Because the king said, isn't this the one about whom it said Saul killed his thousands, David his ten thousands? And David realized his life was at risk. All right? he, it was just him and, and maybe a few followers. And he easily could have been put to death. So when he found himself before the king of Gath, he pretended to be... A crazy man. He let spit run down his beard, and the king said, I have enough crazy men in this kingdom. Get out of here. And David recognized that it wasn't because of his wisdom or cunning that he had gotten out of that situation, but it was actually God who had rescued him. And so David wrote a psalm calling all who would read it, calling ultimately the people of Israel and then the people of God to worship God along with him for the salvation that God had wrought for the future king of Israel. So let's look down at Psalm 34. David says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord and the humble will hear it and rejoice. And now he looks out to the people out of the circumstance of his own rescue. And he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. Do you see how David saw the episode of God's providential deliverance? And it moved him to praise. But he wasn't content to just praise the Lord merely in his heart alone. But it, call, it led him to call others to praise with him and join with him and swell in song. And I, I picked this because last time I stood up here and talk to you guys, I was facing the threat of, of what seemed like it easily could have been death. Burkitt lymphoma, seven months ago, and it feels so much longer than that. Um, I got to stand up here with, with cancer throughout my body, 
And since then, you guys prayed with me, sought the Lord with me. And my experience was that he did rescue me from that circumstance. My, my most recent biopsy was negative. Lab tests from this week were very encouraging. And, and I, I just have to come up and say, I want to praise God in my own heart. And I'm not content to do that with myself merely, but I want to call you guys to praise God with me. You've certainly walked with me through the trial, and we get to praise God together for this. I, I feel like I could say the words with David, oh, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. In verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is, is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. But the reality is that cancer wasn't my greatest fear, and the greatest saving that I have had has nothing to do with cancer, but everything to do with my sin. And being saved from the wrath of God, by God, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And you know what's sweet? It's, it's not me up here saying, look at me, I'm the one who was saved. This is a chance every week in communion for every one of you who believe to say similar things as David, similar things to me. You get to look around at each other and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. From the depth of your despair, when you had nothing good in and of yourself, right? While you were an enemy of God, having nothing good that could please God, we cried out to God in faith and said, like, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Every week we get the chance to do this together, to praise the Lord together for his work in us individually, his salvation of us individually. And I want you to notice that the Lord's Supper is not designed primarily as a private thing. Right, you get to thank God in private prayer each day. You get to praise God as you recount his mercies to you, as you study them in his word, as you read it each day. But we get the privilege every Sunday as we come together as a body to do something together that you can't do, that wasn't designed for you to do alone. Jesus instituted a meal with a group together at a table. That continued through the churches, often with a single loaf of bread, with each person taking a piece, demonstrating that they're all part of one body. It's not something that they ever practiced individually, but together as a church. It's something that we practice together as a church. And it's described by Paul as a proclamation of the Lord's death. Who are we proclaiming to? We're proclaiming this death to one another. So we get through the Lord's Supper, through remembering Jesus as we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice that reminds us of his body broken for us and his blood spilt for us, we get a chance to proclaim to one another and rejoice together in this great God and wonderful salvation. But if you're not a, a Christian, if you don't believe, if you haven't been saved, this time isn't for you. I pray that it makes you want to be saved, that you want to have a part in this. I, I promise that you do. Because apart from God's salvation of you, you, you will face God, but only his wrath, not his love. But Jesus died so that all who would believe could be saved. So I, I, I beg you, just 
repent, turn from your sin, put your faith in God, and even today, take the bread and the juice. But if, if you don't, if you're not a Christian, let that bread and juice pass. This is a time for believers. So now, men, come forward, serve us. And Christians, take the bread, take the juice in your hands. Remember Jesus. And then let's take the bread and juice together as you take it on your own.